Remember from Friday, we talked about what's called the generator effect. It is essentially the opposite of what Orsted taught us in 1819. You remember, 1819, Orsted said an electric current can generate a magnetic field. There was no conditions on that. An electric current always generates a magnetic field. Electric current in a wire produces a circular magnetic field around the wire. Just simply moving charges through the air generates a magnetic field, a circular magnetic field around those moving charges. Okay, always, every single time. As long as you have moving charges, you've got a magnetic field. Now, physics is a very symmetrical subject. Oftentimes, when one thing happens, the opposite of it will happen as well. So 12 years after Oersted's discovery that it, moving charges or electric currents generate magnetic fields, two other guys come along, Michael Faraday and Joseph Henry, and say, well, look, maybe the opposite happens as well. Maybe if an electric current generates a magnetic field, maybe a magnetic field can generate an electric current. Sure enough, it is. It happens. An electric current is generated by a magnetic field, but there's conditions on this. Unlike the current that generates the field, when we have a field generating a current, one of two things has to happen. First of all, you've got to have a conductor in a magnetic field. You've got to have a wire and a magnet. To generate an electric current in the wire, you've got to move one of them. So it doesn't really matter whether you're moving the wire relative to the magnet or you're moving the magnet relative to the wire. In either case, you're going to generate an electric current in that wire. The other way to do it, and we don't talk a whole lot about this in Physics 30 because it's just not a part of what we have to do, you can change the value or change the magnitude of the magnetic field. You've got a wire and you've got a magnet again. If you can change the magnitude of that magnetic field, then you will generate an electric current in the wire. This is the one we want to focus on because this is the real generator effect. This is the one that involves relative motion between the wire and the magnet. So again, remember, Orsted, 1819, oops, Orsted in 1819 says a current produces a magnetic field. Always. In 1831, we say a magnetic field produces a current. But not always. It only happens if one of these two conditions takes place. You move the wire of the magnet, or you change the value of the magnetic field. Does that make sense? This is the main principle, the basic principle behind just about every bit of electricity generation that we have on Earth, at least in terms of the electricity that we use in our houses, right? The electricity that's, that's generated and, and sent over the power grid to our houses and to businesses and to malls and and whatever. Not all of it. Some of it can be generated by solar power, which is not this principle at all. But the vast majority of it is generated by this principle. Whether you're in Alberta, where 80% of the power that we generate is by burning coal, or whether you're in Ontario, where they use a, uh, not a whole lot of coal, they use a lot of nuclear power, and they use a lot of hydroelectric power, okay, or whether you're somewhere in Saskatchewan where they have a natural gas-fired power plant, it doesn't matter. This basic principle it's the principle behind the power generation in all of those cases. Okay, in Alberta, we burn coal. We, we have lots of coal. We like to burn it. We don't care much about the environment in Alberta, so we just burn coal as much as, as, much as we want. When we burn coal, it generates heat. That heat boils water. When water boils, it creates steam. When steam is produced, steam rises. What happens? The steam rises, turns a turbine, that turbine contains wire that's moving through a magnetic field. The wire has a current going through it now. We've just generated an electric current by turning that turbine, by turning that wire through a magnetic field. In Ontario, where they have hydroelectric power plants, okay, water falls down over a dam. What does that water do? It turns a turbine. What's in that turbine? Wire. That wire moves through a magnetic field, generates an electric current in the turbine. Um, in Ontario, they also have nuclear power. They also have nuclear power in New Brunswick, okay, at least in one part of New Brunswick. Um, how does that work? Well, when we split the atom, that generates a lot of heat. What happens? The heat boils water. When water boils, it turns into steam. Steam rises, turns a turbine. 
works exactly the same way as a coal-fired power plant. It's just the way we get the heat, that's all. And we get it by splitting the atom versus lighting a fire and burning coal. It's a lot more efficient than burning coal. And uh, as far as waste goes, as far as pollution goes, it's a lot better than coal because we can contain that waste as opposed to just releasing it up into the air and you know, contaminating the air with all this uh, exhaust from coal-fired power plants. Anyways, they all work the same way. Move a wire through a magnetic field or move a magnetic field relative to a wire, generate an electric current. Is that good? All right, I want you to take a look at the picture that you see up on the board here right now. The first diagram is the one that I want to really want to focus on here. Let's assume this wire is in a magnetic field, as you can see that it is here. Let's assume this wire isn't moving right now, and there's no electric current going through it. So right now, we don't have a velocity. We don't have a magnetic force. Okay? We don't have a hand rule. All we've got is a magnetic field caused by the magnets. And then we've got a wire that's exposed to that magnetic field. And inside that wire, of course, is going to be electrons. There's going to be protons in that wire as well. And it's going to be whatever. But we want to focus on one electron within that wire. Now, that electron isn't moving. There's no current, right? It's just an electron sitting in a wire. Just the same as there's an electron sitting in this water bottle. The same as there's an electron sitting in, in this desk. And sitting in everything. Every bit of matter has electrons sitting in it, right? Let's push this wire upwards. Let's move it upwards. So now its velocity is upwards. Okay, we're physically moving the wire. Maybe it's from you pedaling a bike causes the wire to move. Maybe it's from water coming over a, a dam causing the, the wire to move. Maybe it's from you know, splitting the atom in a nuclear power plant causing steam causing the wire to move through a magnetic field. Any way you look at it, as this wire moves through the magnetic field, the electrons that are inside that wire move with it. So now if we take a look at a hand roll here, we say, look, the electrons are moving upwards. Why? Because we made them move upwards. We pushed them upwards. There's a magnetic field from north to south. That means thumb upwards, fingers towards the right, palm points out of the page, right? There's a force on those electrons that's acting out of the page. What happens to those electrons? I push the wire upward. What happens to the electrons within the wire? They move out of the page. What do you call it when electrons move through the wire in any direction, in this case, out of the page? It's an electric current. So we've just generated an electric current by pushing the wire through the magnetic field and causing a magnetic force along the length of the wire on those electrons. Does that make sense? Why doesn't it work with protons? Shouldn't the protons go in the other direction? They should experience a magnetic force too, right? Why don't they? Why don't they move in the other direction? You guys know the answer to this. Yeah. Protons don't move. Why not? Kevin? Okay. No, not because they're really big, no. Caitlin, is your hand up? Okay. Yeah, good. They're in the nucleus, and the forces keeping them in the nucleus are much, much stronger than the forces keeping the electrons circling around the nucleus. Okay. That's how current is generated. That's how current is generated by the generator effect, at least, which is what the vast majority of current that we have is caused by. I'm going to assign a few questions uh, to work on here. Um, uh, the questions that I want you to do are page 613, number 1 to 3, and 8 to 11. I'm not going to give you a chance to work on those yet, but you'll probably get a chance a little bit later on, maybe when we play a song or two, to uh, take a look at those, okay? The demonstration that we just did, drop a magnet through a copper tube. When I drop a magnet through a copper tube, or for that matter, if I was able to hold the magnet constant or still and drop the copper tube around it, either way, that would generate an electric current. It's Faraday. That's what we've been learning today and on last Friday, the last day that I was here. 
you move a magnetic field through, an, uh, through a, a conductor or you move a conductor around a magnetic field, you're going to generate a current. That current will generate a magnetic field. That's Orsted. Remember 1819, one of the first things that we learned in this unit. You got an electric current, you generate a magnetic field. Well, now we got two magnetic fields. Number one, that was the one that I dropped through the copper tube a few minutes ago. Number two, that was the one that was generated by the current that was produced by the magnet that I dropped through. Two magnetic fields now. Those magnetic fields will always act to oppose the motion. They're always going to act to oppose the motion. So if the motion is downward, the magnetic force will be upwards. If the motion is to the left, the magnetic force will be to the right. It has to oppose, because if it didn't, if it helped the motion, then it would violate the law of conservation of energy. Take a look up here for a second. Just drop your pens for one second here. Let's say that this magnet has 20 joules of gravitational potential energy right now before I drop it. How many joules of kinetic should it have at the bottom of this copper tube if I don't drop it through the copper tube, but rather just drop it through the air that distance. 20 joules of potential up here. How much kinetic does it have down here? 20 joules. That's the law of conservation of energy, right? If I drop it through, and it's not opposed, but rather it, it helps the motion, then it's not going to have 20 joules of potential energy at the bottom. It's going to have 30 or 40. Where do we get the extra energy from? If I have 20 joules at the top, how do I have 40 at the bottom? I've created energy from nothing. It would violate the law of conservation of energy. So it can't be helped through if there's a magnetic force. And we know there has to be a magnetic force because there's two magnetic fields. It must be an opposing force. It must oppose the motion. Otherwise, we'd be creating energy from nothing, and we'd be violating that law of conservation of energy. So Lenz's law, this thing that you just saw in the demonstration, really just a combination of what Orsted taught us at the very beginning of this unit and what Faraday taught us last Friday. Electric current produces magnetic field. Magnetic field produces electric current. Two magnetic fields, they oppose each other.